Roll Cars, a copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. San Francisco Police calling all cars, attention all cars, to broadcast 245 regarding a holdup. There were two bandits. Number one described as five feet, ten inches, weight about 150 pounds. Number two described as blonde, five feet, 11 inches, weight 160 pounds. These men just held up a Safeway store on the Visadero Street. Approach with caution, they're armed and dangerous. That's all. Rose and Quest. What would you think, friends, of a battleship powered by an outboard motor? Ridiculous, isn't it? And yet some motorists practically duplicate it when they underpower their cars with anemic gasoline and nearly go through the motions of protecting their investments with flabby, afraid-to-fight-back motor oil. What gasoline of maximum performance powers more police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and other emergency equipment wherever it is sold than any other brand? Rio Grande cracked. What motor fuel is also the choice of an overwhelmingly large number of California state and federal government officials? to power their front-line automotive equipment. Rio Grande cracked. Right both times, and tens of thousands of motorists likewise agree that Rio Grande cracked is the longer-mileage gasoline that gives them more powerful, more speedful performance, quicker on the takeoff, unfailing acceleration, and smoother operation at any rate of speed. In short, police car performance. Get yours from now on, friends. When you leave the house for work in the morning, stop at the red and white Rio Grande station in your neighborhood and enjoy police car performance in your own car. Rio Grande is indebted to the law enforcement officers of the West, whose enthusiastic cooperation in making all confidential files available make these programs possible. Tonight, we salute San Francisco and their able sheriff, Dan Murphy, who will speak to you from KSFO. It is an acknowledged fact that generally too much of certain types of reading and motion pictures tending to paint a glamorous picture of the daring of gang life and kindred subject, Harold Wind. Those who commit crime pay a price beyond computation. There is not enough money to lighten the empty hours, days, weeks, and months for the loved ones awaiting the return of a prison marked man. One might speculate as to whether or not such thoughts would have deterred the men whose story we are about to hear. Nevertheless, they found, as every criminal eventually finds, that crime is a losing proposition. It is a bitterly cold San Francisco night in December of 1936. An automobile containing two men pulls into the driveway of an oil station at 10th and Mission Street. <laughs> All right, get back into that station, buddy. This is a stick-up. Come on, fella, snap into it. Now open that cash register and then get busy on the floor safe. Come on, come on, quit shaking and get going. We ain't got all night. Yeah, oh. take it easy, kid. When you get to the top of that safe, just don't make no noise and stay where you are, see? Yeah. Then you won't get hurt. All right, Mud, come on, hand over that there door. And remember what I told you. One phony move and I'll blast you, get me? Come on, kid, let's get going. <laughs> Within 20 minutes of this first holdup, two other oil stations fall prey to this bold pair of bandits. And then for three long months, an amazing series of similar crimes are reported almost weekly to the Bay City Police. Inspectors Raymond Doherty and William Hansen, who are in charge of the investigation, are discussing the case when suddenly the police radio flashes a message. San Francisco Police calling car 142, car 142, a holdup at 2900 Fulton Street. A Safeway store held up at 2900 Fulton Street. Another robbery, eh? You suppose this is the work of those two birds we've just been talking about, Dorothy? Well, if it is, those fellows are getting away with murder. You said it. They pulled at least 12 holdups that we know about in the last three months. Yeah, and who knows how many more. Well, if this is their 13th, let's hope their luck breaks with this one and ours begins. 
Attention all cars, attention all cars. Be on the lookout for a stolen Upmobile sedan. License number 4, Chicago 8293. 4, Chicago 8293. Okay. Occupants are two men. One described as tall and blonde. The other short and stocky. These men just held up a Safeway store at 2900 Fulton Street. Exercise caution in apprehending these men. They're both armed. That's all. It's That's them, all right. Come on, let's go. Get the car. I'm going to nab those two birds if it's the last thing I ever do. <laughs> Well, if that stolen hot sedan hasn't already been picked up by some of the boys, we ought to find it somewhere in the vicinity of the robbery. Yeah, that seems to be their system. They generally leave their getaway car within a few blocks of the place they figure on sticking up. If you just get a line on that car of theirs, Hanson, we'd have something to work on. As it is, we haven't got a single lead except a vague description of what they look like. Well, their luck can't hold. The only reason we haven't caught up with them so far is because they don't seem to have any past record. Yeah, I know. Not a doggone one of the victims could identify a picture that even remotely resembled them when we had them look through a stack of mug pictures the other day. Yeah. And we showed them the pictures of every known hold-up man that's been released from a California penitentiary for the last five years. It's funny how they stick to oil stations, cigar stores, and markets. Well, they probably figure those places are the easiest pickings. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, they haven't done so bad either. Met it nearly a thousand dollars in three months. Well, they won't think that so much when they're sitting up there in the pen thinking back over it. Come to think of it, this is their first daytime job, isn't it? Yeah. All the others have been between eight and eleven at night. I'm just wondering if there isn't some. Say, Doherty. Yeah. That hub sedan parked over there by the curb. Huh? I think that's the car we're looking for. Can you see the license plate? A minute. Four C eight two nine three. That's the baby. I'll pull over and park ahead of it a little ways. And keep your fingers crossed. With any kind of a break, we ought to get a lead out of this. Uh-huh. Unless they had their own car planted somewhere around here, they can't be very far away. Hasn't been over 20 minutes since the holdup. Look, that car's right in front of an apartment house. Maybe some of the people inside might have seen who left it there. Well, there's nothing like finding out. Come on, then. We'll try the manager's apartment first. And I'm still keeping my fingers crossed. Yes. I'm uh, sorry to disturb you, lady. We're police officers. Oh, and... police officers. Now, there's nothing to be alarmed about. We're merely trying to get a little information. Oh, I see. There's a Hupmobile sedan parked out in front there. I wonder if by any chance you might have seen who left it. A uh, Hupmobile sedan? Yes. Uh, well, I, I'm afraid I'm not much good at telling one type of car from another. But uh, I'll come out and take a look at it if you want to point it out to me. I'd appreciate it if you would. There, that's the car. I, I'm afraid I, I can't help you any. As far as I know, I, I've i never seen the car before in my life. I was afraid of that. Well, thanks just the same, lady. Uh, do you mind if we use your phone? Oh, no, not at all. You see, that car's been stolen, and I want to report that it's been located. Stolen? Uh, why, uh, I just happened to think. Eh? Yeah? Uh, I was outside just a few minutes before you rang the bell. That car wasn't parked there then. It wasn't? No. Uh, there was a small tan coupe standing there. I don't know what make of car it was. And you didn't see who left it? No. All I know is that I saw the coupe not over five or six minutes ago. Well, Dorothy, there's our first lead. Two weeks went by, during which time the bandits struck again on three different occasions. But the police had not yet been able to trace the small tan coupe. And then, on the evening of March 22nd, Howard Mao and another tenant were on duty in a Safeway store at 301 Divisadero Street when two men walked in. Disregarding the presence of several customers, the smaller of the two came directly to the grocery counter where Mao was standing. Ah, oh, come on. Keep your hands where I can see him, buddy. This is a stick-up. A stick-up? What are you talking about? You heard what I said. Keep that trap of yours shut and hand over the dough. All you got in the place. Now, listen, mister. You can't shut get up, away with... Shut up, can you? One more peep out of you and it's going to be just too bad. Now, shell out the jack. Oh, tough guy, huh? Why, you give me that gun. I'll show you what I... Why, you dirty... Shut up, shut up! Your folks piped on it. Get over there in the back of the store, or you'll see some more shooting. Trying to grab my gun, did you, wise guy? Well, maybe that'll teach you to behave. Hey, you. You over there behind the butcher counter. Come out here and get this dough for me if you don't want to get some of the same medicine. Uh, where's your plug, Muller? I don't know. In the belly, I guess. Okay. Yeah, well, tell that butcher to step on it. We got to scream out of here. Come on, you. Come on. Hurry up with that dough. I'd just as soon lay you out beside this other mug, see? You people in the back there, stay where you are for a good five minutes, see? And no funny business, you get me? Okay, let's beat it, kid. I got the bankroll. <laughs> Thank you. 
With Howard Mao lying in the house pit, put, seriously wounded, the police continue their search for the two bandits with renewed vigor. And then, four nights later, comes the first really important lead. Aaron's Polk Police Station. Is this a desk, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Well, listen. There's three men sitting in a booth here looking at an automatic pistol. I thought I'd better call and tell you about it. Uh, where is this place you're telling me about? It's a beer parlor at 1480 Street. Is that where you're calling from? Yeah. All right, we'll send someone over to see about it. This is the place, all right. I suppose we'll have to search everybody in the place to find that gun. That's all right by me. Maybe the bartender knows something about it. Yeah. Hey, George. Come here a minute, will you? Uh, hello, boys. What'll it be? Has anybody in here been flashing a gun around? Uh, well, uh, not that I know of, no. I see. Well, we'll just have to search everybody, that's all. Well, what makes you think that... A little uh, bird told us. Oh. All right, folks. Pay attention here a minute. Which one of you has got a gun on him? All right, you might as well answer up because we're going to find it anyway. All right, if you don't want to tell us, line up there against the wall, all of you. I'll start at the other end. We'll search these people. Uh-oh. What's this? So you're the lad who's packing a gun, are you? What's your name? Elmer Ballard. Don't you know there's a law against carrying concealed weapons, Elmer? Yes, yeah, so what? So you'll just come on down to the station with us till we get a chance to find out something about you. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, look, coppers, what's the beat? This guy wasn't doing no harm. Just showing us his gun, was all. Who are you, a friend of Elmer's? Uh, yeah, yeah, in a way, I know him in here. Well, I'd keep my mouth shut if I were you, unless you want to come along, too. Oh, all right. Okay, Elmer, go out and get in the car. Oh, he's a bunch of lousy coppers. Say, Al. Yeah? As soon as them cops drive away, come on outside. I think I know who tipped them. Yeah? Yeah. See that guy sitting up there at the bar? The guy was in the telephone booth a little while ago. Hey, you mean you think he's the one who tipped him? Well, that telephone booth ain't his office. Yeah? We'll wait here till he comes out. Then I'm going to show him what I do with still pigeons like him. Hey, quiet. Here he comes now. Yeah. Hey, listen, wise guy. Yeah? You tipped them bulls about Elmer having my gun, didn't you? Who says I did? I do. And maybe this will teach you to be smart after this. <laughs> Come on, what's the idea? Hey, Walter, let me get in a shock at this guy, will you? Oh. Say, hell, you... Hit him kind of hard, didn't you? Gosh, his head's bleeding, ain't it? But I didn't do that with my fist. See, it's where his head hit the sidewalk. And anyway, it looks like a gun to me. So long, Al. I'll be seeing you. Yeah. On the arrival of the ambulance, the man who had been beaten was pronounced dead. Al Levere was placed under arrest, but his companion had disappeared. A few days later, it was discovered that the bullet that had wounded Howard Mao had been fired from the gun found on Elmer Ballard. Immediately, Inspector Butes and Corporal Engler, who had taken over the investigation, went up to the city prison to question the two prisoners. I don't know how you feel about it, Engler, but I think these two are the fellows we want for all those holdups. Well, we ought to know something in a minute. The guard's bringing them over here now. Uh, hello, Ballard. You and Levere sit down, won't you? I want to have a little talk with you. Whatever you say, copper, you're the boss. You've got a pretty serious charge hanging over your head, Levere. Don't you think it would be wiser if you decided to tell us the truth? Now, look, I have been telling you the truth, see? This guy, Walter Misak, was calling us by our names. Are you and... still sure you don't know Walter's last name? Now, listen, Inspector, but if I knew his last name was, I'd only be too glad to tell you, but I don't know it. What about you, Ballard? I only knew him as Walter, same as Al here. I yeah. never heard anybody call him anything else. You see, it's just like I told you at first. This guy was calling us names, and Walter stepped in and let him have it, see? Then I took up where he left off. Where'd you fellas meet this Walter? In a beer parlor. He's been hanging around there for a couple of months. Spent quite a bit of money, too. He did, eh? Yeah. Where'd he get it, do you know? It wasn't none of our business where he got it. You don't happen to know what he did for a living, do you? No, fact is, I never knew Walter to do any work. And you don't know where he lived? You never told anybody around there that I know of. You don't know either, Ballard? No. Did either of you ever see him with an automobile? I had a car, all right. It's a Chrysler sedan with 1936 license plates. <laughs> 36 plates, eh? Yeah, he said the new ones was coming down from Sacramento. I see. Do you know where he kept this car? No, but I know the service station where he always buys his gas. Maybe they can tell you something there. Hey, give me a pencil. I'll write it down on a piece of paper for you. Yeah, address at me. Okay. Sure you boys don't know anything more about this fellow than you're telling me? I don't know nothing about him at all. All right. We'll be in to see you again in a day or so. Right. Don't bother. So long, boys. And we'll... Yeah, 
This is the filling station of the Vera Red Down. Well, let's hope we'll be able to get some kind of a line on this fellow Walter that we could follow up. Good afternoon. Fill your tank, sir? No, thanks. We're just looking for a little information. Yes, sir. Do you know a man by the name of Walter who owns a Chrysler sedan? Oh, Walter? That's his given name, I understand. We don't know what his last name is. Well, I, I think I know the man you mean. You are trying to locate him, are you? That's about the size of it. We'd appreciate any information you can give us. Well, I can't think of his last name myself offhand, but I I think I have it in my file somewhere. And see if you can find the license number of his car while you're at it. In just a moment, sir. Thanks. It may be just the break we're looking for. Well, I hope so, Angler. You know, I've got a hunch this fellow will turn out to be one of those two bandits just as sure as the world. <laughs> Are your hunches usually any good? No, I think this one's going to be. Fine. Here you are, sir. This card ought to give you the information you want. Oh, thanks a lot. Hmm. Walter Grannis, five feet, six inches tall, weight 150 pounds. Hey, that tells exactly with our description of the shorter of the two bandits. Uh -huh. We're on the right trail now, no mistake. The car is registered to 1622 Clay Street. Yeah, that's right. I've got it all copied down here. And let's get on over to that address. Is there anything else I can do, sir? No, that's fine. And thanks a lot, old man. <laughs> clock already, and that apartment's dark as a tomb. Yeah. It would be just our luck not to find anybody home when we got here. Well, this business of staking out in cold weather is part of the fun of being a police officer. Mm -hmm. If this fellow Grannis doesn't show up pretty soon, I'm going to send somebody for an overcoat. <laughs> well, we've been parked out here since four o'clock. You know, Angler, I've been thinking about that story Ballard told us. You mean about having bought the gun they found on him from Walter Grannis? Yeah. If he only answered the description of the taller bandit, I'd say the man was merely lying to save his hide, but as it is, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I see what you mean. I want to believe that he's telling the truth, partly for his own sake, and partly because his story definitely pins the mouth shooting on this man, Grannis. Anyway, I think the lead we've got from that service station out there. Hey, hold on a minute. Wait, wait. I think those people are going into the apartment house we're watching. Yeah, you're right. It's a woman and a couple of children. Come on, Angley. Here's where we go to work. Just a moment, please, if you don't mind. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Well, what is it? We'd like to know if a man named Walter Grannis lives here. Why, uh, no, he doesn't. Are you a relative of his? I'm his uh, sister. Oh, I see. Do you know where we can find him? No, I don't. He moves around quite a lot. I don't see much of him. What do you want with him? We're from the police department, lady. Police? Yeah, Why, we're investigating you... a crime of a very serious nature, so oh. I want to tell you right now that it'll be best all around if you tell us nothing but the truth. Well, I, um, that is, uh... Well, I'm Walter Grannis's ex-wife. Oh, I see. We've been separated for about seven years. Uh, and you see, he doesn't come around here very often. I was mistaken about that, officer. He generally drops in about twice a week. Uh, but you still insist that you don't know where he lives. No, I don't. Really, officer, that's the truth. But I think he keeps his car in a garage in the Western Edition, near Divisadero Street somewhere. So he probably lives close by. Uh, when do you expect him to come around here again? Well, he, uh, he said he'd be here tomorrow. Yeah? He's waiting for his new license plate from Sacramento, and they'll be coming to this address. Well, I want to get in touch with him right away. There was a murder committed in a oh. street brawl, and... Uh... Oh, no, not a murder. Now, don't worry, lady. Oh. Grannis isn't in any way implicated. We merely want him for a witness, that's all. Oh. Word is immediately broadcast describing the Chrysler sedan belonging to Grannis, along with the license number. And the following morning, officers, acting on the information supplied by the bandit's ex-wife, locate the car in the Grove Street garage. Learning from the attendant the name of the apartment house, where their man can be found, Engler and Inspector Hansen waste no time in getting there. Ah, oh, there's no sense in fooling with this door any longer, Inspector. Besides that double lock already on there, there's this padlock. I think the owner lives in the building. They wouldn't get the keys Stop from him. Now, what's all this noise going on up here? Are you the owner of this building? Yes. What of it? Well, you're just the man we want to see. Well, you wish I hadn't if you don't stop that racket. I can hear you clear down on the first floor. What are you trying to do? Break into that room? That's about the size of it. We're police officers. I don't care who you are. That doesn't give you any call to go around smashing people's doors. Keep your shirt on, mister. We're not smashing any doors. And we'd appreciate it if you'd open up this apartment for us. I'll do nothing of the kind. Sarge, I haven't got the keys to that apartment. The only ones there are belong to the tenant. Well, it might interest you to know that this tenant is wanted on a charge of robbery. Well, it doesn't interest me. I don't know anything about the man who lives here and care less. Does that mean you don't intend to cooperate with us? You bet it does. Furthermore, I don't want cops hanging around my apartment house. So I'd get... think again if I were you, mister. You can't threaten me. I have no intention of threatening you. 
I merely want to warn you that if you refuse to cooperate, we'll simply have to enter these rooms by force, that's all. You, you can't do this. You, you, you got the warrant. <laughs> I'm going to call your headquarters and report to <laughs> <laughs> Nice fella. He sure worked himself into a stew, didn't he? Oh, well, you've got to expect to meet up with people like that sometimes. But we've got to get into this apartment. I noticed a paint shop down the street when we came up here. They've most likely got a ladder that'll reach three stories. We can climb in from the outside. Hey, that's an idea. Go on over there and see what you can do, Engler. I'll be right back. Hey, that does it. Yeah, that ladder idea of yours was a burst of genius, Engler. Yeah. <laughs> look, look out for your head climbing over the sill there. Ah. Hey, let's see what we can find. Hmm. Doesn't keep this apartment of his very clean, does he? You'd never mistake it for a lady's boudoir, if that's what you mean. Well, I'll begin on these bureau drawers. Find anything? No, nothing yet. Just the usual odds and ends. Keep on looking while I take a glance through this closet over here. This dresser is a mess. Granite must have... Uh-oh. What is it? Hey, look here, Inspector. Uh. Well, a 25 caliber automatic pistol and a box of 32 caliber shells, huh? Yeah, that box of shells makes it look like Ballard's story about buying the gun might be true at that. And now inquiries in the neighborhood where Granis had lived began to yield information. It was learned that he had been keeping company with a girl whose sister had recently moved to San Mateo. Therefore, Corporal Engler, Inspector Sustead... Fred Butts and William Hansen and Special Officer Jimmy Britt of the National Automobile Theft Club drove to that city where, by careful search, they located the woman they now wanted as an important link in their chain of evidence. Are you Miss Travers? Yes. We're officers from the San Francisco Police Department. We'd like you to give us a little information, if you will. Certainly. Won't you come in? Thank you. As a matter of fact, I, I rather thought that you might come here. You did? Uh, why was that? Well, first, may I ask what kind of information you're looking for? Well, we're trying to locate a man named Grannis, Walter Grannis. Oh, that's the answer I expected. You see, he came down here yesterday with my sister. Oh, yeah? Go on. She told me the police were looking for them, that they were making a getaway and going to Los Angeles. Going to Los Angeles, huh? Yes. Do you think they went on down the coast from here? No, because Walter didn't have his own car. He had one that he'd borrowed from a friend of his to use for the day. I see. But did he say what this friend's name was? Well, he referred to him as Elmer, I believe. He didn't mention any last name. And do you suppose he meant Elmer Ballard, Inspector? Oh, I don't see how it could be. Ballard's been in jail now for weeks. Did you get a chance to see the car Grannis was driving, Miss Travers? Why, yes, I, I did. Oh, could you describe it? It was a tan Chrysler Coupe, as I remember. Tan Coupe. Dollars to donuts, that's the car that apartment house manager told you about three weeks ago, Inspector. Well, to be honest with you, gentlemen, I... I'm terribly worried about my sister, Ethel. She's going around in pretty bad company. <laughs> I'll agree with you there, Miss Travers. I don't think Ethel's done anything that's really against the law yet. So when you arrest Walter, will you please try to keep her away from being involved as much as you can? Well, we'll do everything in our power in that respect, Miss Travers, I assure you. But uh, now we've got to be getting back to the city. Thank you very kindly for your cooperation. It's perfectly all right. Bye. Goodbye. 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 Oh, that's a darn nice girl. Uh -huh. Too bad her family has to be bothered with a guy like Granite. Well, the thing to do now is to find out who this fellow Elmer is. Nothing hard about that. What mm -hmm. do you mean, nothing hard about it, Britt? Remember when you had me go through the records to find out who the legal owner of Granite's car was? Sure. What's that got to do with it? Well, I checked with the owner in regard to Granite's references, and I found out who they were. So what? So we don't have to look any further to find out Elmer's identity. I know who he is. He's Elmer Mohegan. Signed as a reference for Granis when he bought the car. Well, have you got Mahegan's address there? Oh, I bet it's somewhere. That's 19th and uh, Caps. How do you do? Is Mr. Mahegan at home? Are you friends of his? Why, yes. Yeah. Well, he isn't home right now. He just went out with some other people to buy some crabs. They're going to have a chipino. Oh, I see. I don't believe they'll be gone very long. Uh, would you like to come in and wait? No, thanks. We're really having the time right now, but we'll be back later. 
We want to see him about a job. Oh, well, that's fine. Come back whenever you're ready. I'm sure Elmer will be glad to see you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. That's perfectly all right. Now, listen, boys. Yeah? We've got two cars here. We'll split up into two parties. Drive each car about a half a block from the house, one up the street and the other down. Uh-huh. Park that way, Elmer will be right between us when he drives in, and besides, we'll have a clear view of who arrives and enters the house. Okay. Now, let's get going. Engler, you stay with me. Yes, sir. And be careful, boys. These boys are tough to... <laughs> How long have we been waiting now, Engler? Well, just half hour, Inspector. It's taking them a deuce of a while to buy those crabs. Yeah. Say, hey, here comes a Chrysler Coupe now, just rounding that corner. Yep, that's it, all right. There's four of them in there. A man and a woman in the front and a man and a woman in the rumble seat. All right, boys, pull in behind them. The other car will hit them off from the front. Put up your hands and get out of that car. Hey, what is this you mugs is trying to pull anyhow? Now, take it easy, Granite. And don't any of you be silly enough to try to reach for a gun. Say, what's the big idea, coppers? We ain't done nothing. Frisk them good boys and then slip the cuffs on them while I talk to the woman. You ain't got nothing on Walter. No? What do you know about what Walter's been doing? None of your business. Well, sir, you're going to take that attitude, are you? What's your name? I don't know. Where do you live? I don't know. Well, maybe you think you could talk better down at headquarters. Is that it? I don't know. Now, I know who you are, Ethel. I told your sister I'd try to give you a break, but I can't do anything for you if you're going to act this way. I don't want no breaks from you, copper. All right. It's up to you. Nah. You can take this girl down to the station with the men, boys. Right. All right, boys, let's get going. Say, you coppers just won't give a guy a break, will you? You got your break, Grannis, when Howard Mao was lucky enough not to die from that bullet you shot into his stomach. That's a better break than you deserve, and it's the only one you're going to get. Just a moment, we will hear the concluding facts on this program. Your automobile is just as important a part of your daily life as those which figured in the apprehension of Granis and Mahigan. Get police car performance with Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Safeguard all of its vital moving parts with Rio Lube, the stronger, tougher motor oil that can't break down. April 5th, Grannis and Mahegan pleaded guilty and were sentenced to Folsom Penitentiary on two counts of first-degree robbery with the recommendation that they be shown no leniency and that they never be granted parole. San Francisco police calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 245 regarding a holdup. Suspects in this case are now in custody. That's all. Rosenblatt. <laughs>